Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't like to know, wouldn't we? Yeah.
first reading will be from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33. I have it on the screen here to make it a bit easier, perhaps. We'll see if it shows up on the video or not. We'd like to read this for us, Jeremiah 33, just two verses, 14 to 16. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and Judah. In those days, in that time, I will raise up for David a just shoot. He shall do what is right and just in the land. In those days, Judah shall be safe, and Jerusalem shall dwell secure. This is what they shall call her, the Lord our justice. Very good. A very brief selection from Jeremiah. Again, the prophet Jeremiah, he lived at the end of the kingdom of Judah. The northern, half, northern part of Israel had been taken um, centuries before, about two centuries before, roughly 100, 100 more years before uh, Babylon conquered the south. Assyria took the north, Babylon would take the south. And Jeremiah is there in the last days, so he speaks, he tells them to be faithful to God, but also looks to the future when God will end this sort of uh, fear of destruction that they all have. And again, there was a king in David's line who was king in Jerusalem at the time, king of Judah. But Jeremiah speaks of the coming exile and things that will happen, so he promises a just shoot. And the word just, as we have that, um, he'll do what's right and just in the land. He speaks a lot about the authority of the king to make peace, to be safe and secure. So he talks a lot about um, the peace of God, one who reigned in righteousness, as opposed to the injustice that was there at the time. And he himself, Jeremiah, was falsely accused and imprisoned a few times, and almost killed him once. I think this is a good desire for all times to have just government, just rulers. We want to do, do is right and just in the land. We can be safe and secure. That's really the desire of all peoples of all times. Again, the Lord our justice. So justice is used three times there. A just shoot. He'll do what's right and just. The Lord our justice. And that's been the cry for the last um, over 100 years. The popes in their writings, speaking of just society, they call it the social doctrine of the church. And Pope Benedict mentioned, too, in that um, encyclical, God is love, that we can't have even charity until we have justice first, the basic um, equity in dealing with each other. So he talks, ask for justice between nations, uh, some oppressing others, taking the resources from another for yourself, and then having just exchange of goods. A lot of injustice nowadays, which breeds, of course, violence and hatred among peoples. So what's your take on this prophecy of Jeremiah, promise for justice? You mentioned fear, fear of destruction. I think, yeah. I think that's something that we are all sort of experiencing these days with everything that's going on in the world. Now describe for me, since I'm too young to know this, um, the era of the Cold War, how did that compare to the feeling now of destruction? Because then it was a button and we're all destroyed. Nuclear warfare, the whole world's gone. You know, so how, how does the fear now of terrorism compare to the, that fear of the nuclear holocaust that was promised? What do you think? Any? I think it's, it's worse now because um, in the original instance of the Cold War, I was I was too young to really take it seriously. The, the world was a million, you know, I was yeah. a million miles away. It wasn't really going to affect me. But there was a lot of discussion that I remember discussion that we were supposed to be so fearful of, you know, this instantaneous uh, death. But I feel more serious about it now because I realize that could happen. Yeah. I mean, it could very well happen at any time just by, you know, some whim of some, you know, this 26-year-old radical guy that's trying to blow up Paris yeah. him and, his, and his group. Um, and I guess I feel more vulnerable now because of my age, too. I would, I would say that. You know, I can't. I can't imagine myself going out and fighting a war. Yeah. At the time, you know, when I was in the army, I never had to really worry about it, but I felt capable mm -hmm. of doing it. Maybe now, 
us the technology is more portable, more people have access to it, that it was just big governments which had a lot of safeguards, even though there was certainly plenty of injustice in the Soviet Union, there was some understanding that uh, this mutual assured destruction wouldn't be good for them either, so there wasn't the, quite the take. And we had, of course, people kind of favoring destruction in our own country, but they were checked by different groups and everything. But now there's not that. If someone decides, it's my mission to destroy you people, I'll do it, they can do it. It seems like we have, society never really learns. It never really learns the lesson. Yeah. It's like now we're talking about deporting 12 million people from the United States. It's, it's so illogical, but it's the same thing that happened with the Holocaust. I mean, they treated those people as if they were nothing, and we're talking about doing the same thing over and over. You know, they say if, if you don't remember what happened, you're, you're prone to have to live through it again. I mean, yeah. if you don't learn from it, it's just like when I hear a certain politician talking, I think, He's not very far away from Gestapo. He wants a, what's it he call it? His uh, immigration police. Oh, yeah. You know, they already have those on the border. There's quite a few. But I'm saying they're, they want to go door to door in Ohio and, and Michigan and any, you know, any place there are. You know, up yeah. in Michigan, they have a lot of Somalis in Michigan. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Up around Detroit. I mean, are they talking Columbus about. Columbus, too, for that matter. And they're talking about going door to door and rounding people up. <laughs> yeah. You wonder again, I mean, we're a nation of immigrants, so even from that perspective, is that wise? The gospel, of course, not. But even legally speaking, it's like that doesn't make any sense. There's other ways to pursue, to right wrongs, I would think, you know. See, I, I don't, I guess I've totally assimilated into the American culture. I mean, my family's been here for forever. Yeah. Since uh, from 1832. So to me, it, just, I don't feel as if I'm in, I don't live that immigrant yeah. experience. I never have. I know lots of people have, like you know, Beth, Beth uh, Heidinger, Beth House. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's very aware of her roots because her family came uh, from Italy in 19, whatever, 1920 or something. So she's very much that way, but to me, I'm, I'm an American. I don't think of myself as an Irish immigrant. And your people come from Ireland? My family came from Ireland, yeah. yes, they oh, do. There's some Im immigrants. In oh, yeah, there's immigrants. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, back I'm, yeah. the, I'm the offspring yeah. of immigrants, right, but, but I just don't feel that. Well, that's about maybe they were crucified, too. You know? Yeah. Well, and there was. There was much injustice, you know, and I think it's good you mentioned the his lessons of history. We've had that before where a group doesn't assimilate right away, of course. That's why the Mafia was here. They were they affecting their own interests. At various, it wasn't just Italians, it was other groups too. Um, the idea was, look, well, watch out for our own. Then they had their own like law and government stuff. And the U.S., you know, everyone else said, hey, what are you guys doing? They had to fight against that. And our Gangs of New York, that movie, talks about the Irish Mafia, the Italian Mafia, all these groups, you know, had to fight and everything. But you know, why did they do that? It was because they were so put down, you know? It wasn't right with what, those, what a mafiosa did. But you can understand why they did it, you know. You say, well, what's the what's the solution? It seems like justice would be a better way to go, you know. Well, I suspect that that my forebears experienced some of that because they were I mean, they were the only Irish family for miles. Yeah, it was all Germans, people who settled here from uh, Alsace Lorraine and mm -hmm. all of that. And so, I suspect that there was a lot of prejudice. I I don't, I don't have any historical data about that. But you've got to think about, well, like in Tiffin, they had a, they had a Irish Catholic church and they had a German Catholic That's church. That's right. When the Germans came, they said, we want our own church, and so they made a different one, St. Joe's. Yeah. yeah. It's true, yeah. And I think about with my great-grandfather sitting in the pews over here, he was probably the only Irishman, him and his offspring, yeah. were yeah. the only Irishman around. Yeah. That's very true, and I mean... Um, you know, we have, again, people don't like to think in nuance or see the complexity. So we have, especially in the political realm, we have two facets of it. We have, if there's violence done by immigrants or problems, then it's all our fault. So it, it's all our fault. We blame ourselves for everything. That's the one side. And the other side says, like, well, get rid of everyone to fix the problem. Like, well, that's not justice either, you know. So really, again, the truth is, again, 
the scriptures, it tells what to do. Uh, God says, you know, welcome the resident alien, treat them well in your midst, tells Israel that many times. And those were pagans. These are not people who love the real God. They worship false gods. He said, show respect to them. And the idea is like you'll convert them. So that's the purpose of having these people. Um, so that Israel is even very, God tells them very well, says, you yourselves were aliens once in Egypt. You were the people who were oppressed. Uh, don't ever do that to anyone else. Of course, they don't listen then, right? But none of us listen ever. So he says, don't do that. He said, he doesn't mean you have to uh, approve what they do because they, they worship pagan gods back then. He said, don't approve what they do. Don't do what they do. Said, but encourage them, you know, repeat them with respect and justice, and then evangelize them. So that's really the key. So I think that's kind of a template for us as well that uh, those that resident alien in our midst, those people, uh, don't have to approve of everything they do, don't have to become what they are, but treat them with basic justice and respect, and then to always to evangelize. You know, so even in the Old Testament, they said they were allowed to take part of the Passover if they became circumcised, if they, they became one of God's people. So their origin didn't matter. It's like if you want to become one of us, you surely can. You know, but we won't treat you like um, a pariah. You're off there somewhere, but we'll welcome you. Um, so we have again that base level of justice seems to be the, the springboard from which the gospels call us to, uh, to preach the gospel, you know, to, to proclaim Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament too speaks about that. You know, so even there was there was war again with other nations in the Old Testament. Uh, they had to fight against many, even the people in the Promised Land. But there are a couple, there are many who said, nope, we want to join you guys, let's work together. And they did. You know, the whole towns would become part of the Jewish people back then, the people of Israel. So I think we do have a good uh, good model for what to do in our own age, too, of what to do. But still, it's driven by fear. I mean, my reaction is driven by fear. Oh, yeah. And all of us are. And fear is a motivator, right? It keeps us alive, but then we can misapply it sometimes, you know, or we're called to even tr to transcend that natural fear with a supernatural trust, supernatural faith. Called us to do that. That's why he even had to tell it to Israel. If it was natural just to welcome the stranger easily, God wouldn't tell us to do it, you know? He had to tell us, like, make sure you eat food every day and go to sleep. We're going to do that anyway, you know? The scripture says, you know, you're not going to do this naturally uh, to welcome a stranger because there's fear there that they're, they'll, now that they'll attack me, they're different than me. So he said, no, work to welcome the stranger, you know, to, to invite them, make them part of, part of your life, and again, to do basic justice to them. And I think that's really the answer. So again, we can look at the scriptures for, you know, solutions to modern problems. They can help us a lot with figuring that out. That's, a, that's really true. I mean, when you think about this, this is, what's going on now is is rooted in biblical history. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, big time. A lot of good thoughts, a lot of, a lot of pertinent thoughts about that. Three reading from Jeremiah. <laughs> now, our psalm is Psalm 25. Let's review it briefly here. Um, the response is to you, Lord, I lift up my soul. So he says, Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. For you I wait all the day. God giving God the teacher, the one who gives instruction and in truth. Good and upright is the Lord. Thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice. Is that theme again? He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are kindness and constancy. For those who keep his covenant and his decrees. The friendship of the Lord is with those who fear him, and his covenant for their instruction. So we have fidelity to God, I'll um, be formed in truth and justice. I follow in God's humility is how I learn these things. He guides the humble to justice, teaches the humble his way. That dovetails well with our initial thoughts too, humility. If I'm humble, not exalting myself, my own way of life, but listening and welcoming others in humility, I'll learn the justice of God, I'll learn the ways of God. The word in the second last line, the friendship of the Lord is with those who fear him. Mm. I, I was struck by that when we had choir practice, and I'm singing that verse in the, in the response to our song, and I came to that word and I thought, I hadn't really thought about the friendship of God. The friendship. Yeah. And I think that's a key maybe to this whole s issue with the immigrants is that if you treat them like friends, if you treat them like friends, then it's going to be difficult for them to turn against you. Mm -hmm. If you accept their ways, they're not going to be uh, angry you know, about being uh, rejected. Thessalonians 3, um, 12 and 14. 
one, St. Paul, he visited them briefly. Um, I think it was after he had to leave Corinth, if I'm not mistaken. He had to leave somewhere. So he saw the Thessalonians, he preached the gospel to them, but he couldn't stay very long. So he had to write them a letter to correct a few errors they had. Uh, and several of these were, um, don't get up to work because Christ is coming back any second now if they stop working. Um, and then also that what happens to those who die before Jesus comes back? Are they gone forever? They can't be raised up. So he had to correct those, those couple things there. Um, so he says a few, a few things to them. If you'd like to read this for us. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we have for you, so as to strengthen your hearts to be blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his holy ones. Amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, we earnestly ask and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you should conduct yourselves to please God, and as you are conducting yourselves, you do so even more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Um, and looking at the bottom of page 11 there it says 
Um, we can tell um, St. Luke is the author in a special style. Uh, he gets very elegant Greek. They mentioned that. Um, so he's writing on his own. It's not just uh, quoted from other sources. Uh, he talks about cures and gives a detailed medical knowledge, the technical term. So he distinguishes a couple um, different conditions. I think the other Gospels might mention this, but there's lunatics, demoniacs. You know, lunatics were, uh, the technical word was those who were affected by some physical state. So it relates to the moon, that's where luna tick comes from. So they were affected by some physical things. They weren't possessed by demons. And St. Luke goes into more detail about certain things. And the one, the one famous uh, example where the woman had a hemorrhage for years, she saw many doctors and wasn't cured. Other Gospels say, in fact, she got worse. St. Luke doesn't say that part because he's a doctor. He leaves that part out. <laughs> He mentions that, yeah, she, doctors couldn't cure. Um, first, he wrote Acts of the Apostles. He has the same preface. And he even says, in the first volume, I told you this. In the second volume, Acts of the Apostles, I'll tell you this now. Um, the disciple of St. Paul as well. Because they said the language and doctrine is very similar uh, to St. Paul's letters as well. But clearly not St. Paul who was writing. They mentioned things like that. Um, on the bottom of that page, they mentioned the apostolic figure of St. Luke. Acts of the Apostles says many things. Um, he talks a lot about the church of Antioch, more so than anyone else, which indicates he is from there. And also a Gentile, his group with other Gentiles. In St. Paul's letter, he was not a Jew. Um, he became a Christian quite early, we think, though we're not sure when exactly. But he did not see the Lord, so he had to rely upon the, the apostles. And actually, the apostle there mentions um, he was a companion of St. Paul. In fact, he shifts in this uh, first-person plural a couple of times. says, we went here, we went there. So we know he was with St. Paul for quite a long time. Um, they mentioned a couple places he went with St. Paul. Um, then, sec then the next paragraph, second letter of Timothy, Paul refers to Lucas being his only com uh, companion during his second imprisonment in Rome. And only Luke is here with me. So Luke was there, went to Rome with him as well. And tradition says he went and preached the gospel in Bithynia and Achaia after the death of St. Paul. And it says he um, suffered much in the name of Christ and died filled with the Holy Spirit. But the details aren't known to us too much. So St. Luke's Gospel, again, he's going to uh, focus especially on a, a Gentile perspective. So he'll fill in some of the details about Jewish things that we don't understand, that people in his time wouldn't understand. And also, he consults a lot of a lot of sources. And they tried to show that like he contradicts Matthew and Mark, but really he doesn't. He gives a little more detail on certain governors and uh, different elements of the, the rule of the region that the others didn't concern themselves with so much. Again, being from Syria, he talks about the Syrian governor and different things like that that the others weren't so focused on because they weren't from Antioch like he was. So it's pretty clear there. Um, I may give you that next page about, uh, yeah, historical accuracy. They mentioned that. The Biblical Commission 1912 has talked about that as well. St. Luke. Um, it's vouched for by the author's declared intent to write a true account would enlighten and confirm the faith of his readers. In the prologue, um, St. Luke writes as a historian. And one special style historians did, they wrote a lot of people giving speeches. So St. Luke, you'll see, he focused a lot on the speeches people give, like St. Peter at Pentecost, different ones Jesus gives. He focused a lot on speeches. They like to declare history that way. Um, he references secular history quite a lot. Other ones don't do that so much. Speak about that. And again, um, one theme of St. Luke, especially, is uh, Mary. Uh, the others don't mention uh, Mary's perspective as much as St. Luke does. The tradition also holds that St. Luke uh, talked a lot about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he got a lot of her perspective. Only he talks about the um, Annunciation. It's not in St. Matthew's Gospel. St. Matthew has Joseph's perspective, speaks about um, Mary was found with child of the Holy Spirit, Joseph has the dream. St. Luke, though, must have had some first-hand account from Mary herself. It's the only thing she would know about the angel, what the angel said to her, Gabriel, her visiting Elizabeth, Magnificat, and even St. John the Baptist. Um, Mary would have known that, too, because she saw Elizabeth for quite a few months and stayed with her, but she would have heard the account from St. Elizabeth as well. Because um, St. no one else could get it, because um, they were probably dead by that point. They were quite old by the time St. Luke was alive. And also John the Baptist was killed before, so he couldn't be interviewed. So it seems like this is really, in a sense, Mary's gospel that St. Luke gives us. A lot of things from her perspective the others don't mention. Now John, of course, St. John took care of Mary, and so he has a lot of special things too. Wedding at Cana, and also the foot of the cross. He gives a lot more of that. But he wrote after St. Luke, so he doesn't, he doesn't tread the same ground again. St. Luke gave us a lot of details here. So that's
that's a lot of that st. luke. so again, really interesting to see the the things they bring out, their own personality coming through the gospel and the way they focus on certain things for us. and st. luke especially with the medical knowledge, historical accuracy, wanted to give good detail about the secular setting and also mary's perspective too. so a lot of good details there. Well, our selection today is from, again, the end of Luke's Gospel. We're still in end times talk. Advent begins the same way the church year ends. And we're in the Olivet Discourse, it's called. This is the Mount of Olives. After they leave the temple, Jesus says it will be destroyed. And then his disciples question him in the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the Temple Mount it's outside Jerusalem. So it's called the Olivet Discourse in Luke and also Mark's, St. Mark's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel. Um, so we have here, I'll just read this for us, Luke 21, skips around a bit. 25 through 28, and verses 34 to 36. Jesus said to his disciples, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. And on earth nations will be in dismay, perplexed by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads. Because your redemption is at hand. And later he says, Beware your hearts not become drowsy from carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of daily life. And that day catch you by surprise like a trap. For that day will assault everyone who lives in the face of the earth. Be vigilant at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent and to stand before the Son of Man. We refer a lot to David Curry's book, his wonderful book, about the rapture it goes on to end times again St. Daniel's prophecy there's a lot about uh, end times in St. Daniel he's given the timetable for the Messiah's return and the problems that will happen before that so St. Daniel gives the statue with the four parts uh, the four beasts that will come and uh, the little horn who raises and attacks God's people so it's fulfilled initially in Antiochus Epiphanes who was the Greek successor to Alexander the Great in Palestine he persecuted the people in Maccabee we hear about that but of course, it's fully fulfilled in uh, the church being persecuted, the temple being destroyed, Nero Caesar, all the problems that happened there. Well, the little thing here, this idea, it starts off as St. Luke. He said there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. What's this all about, you know? Now, we said before in the homilies, I've mentioned how uh, Jesus is prophesying the temple's end right here. We do have a pattern, though, for the full end times. We'll look at uh, Father Lapide's commentary in a second. But from David Curry, I have this little thing here. What are the signs in the star? What's it all about here? Well, there on page 180, in the back of your handout there, I have for you this. He mentions in that second full paragraph here, um, he, well, the first one he says about um, Josephus, uh, he mentions how there were these accounts eyewitnesses saw. He said this, I said, I suppose this would seem to be a fable were not related by those who saw it. He says, this seems kind of weird, but here's what people saw at this time. He says, there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city, Jerusalem, and a comet that continued a whole year before the Jews' rebellion. So great a light shone around the altar and the holy house, means the temple, it appeared to be bright daytime, which lasted for half an hour. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. The men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord. So these publicly declared at the signal foreshadowed desolation that was coming upon them. A few days after, before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running among, about among the clouds. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. This is pretty, pretty epic uh, kind of signs that happen there. Josephus gives even more to a man who prophesied for seven years and all these crazy things happening. There are a lot of these signs here in the sun, the moon, and the stars. A lot of difficult things going on there. Powers of heaven shaken. And the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory. Now then, Father Lapide talks about this a little bit. He doesn't talk about it in St. Luke's Gospel because the same is given in Matthew. So here's his commentary the parallel parts of Matthew's Gospel. Um, and they mentioned after the tribulation, all these things happening. And Father Lapid, he says, um, 
Well, think about the persecutions and temptations which arise from false messiahs and false prophets, false Christs. He said, or rather the tribulation, which came upon the Jews at the siege of Jerusalem by Titus. So he sees again the initial fulfillment of this prophecy had already happened, the temple being destroyed. But there will be, of course, future things that are similar. He mentions this here. Um, and he mentions different saints, St. John Chrysostom, St. Jerome. Uh, they observed to keep his disciples and those who succeeded them in expectation of his advent, his arrival, that's what advent means, and the day of judgment, and to urge them to be prepared. Um, he seems to favor the mistake of the apostle to speak as though the end of the world would follow immediately Jerusalem's destruction. In a different way, the apostles understood it. So for all those 1,560 years, he's writing 1,560 at this time, this commentary, have elapsed since Jerusalem was destroyed, Many more will yet elapse before the end of the world. Nevertheless, all this period, long as it seems to us, whose span of life is so short, compared with God's eternity, who is a true measure of time, is very small. Now again, we have David Curry talked about why does it seem like it takes forever for these things to happen. He said, well, again, Jesus answers two questions the apostles ask. When will the temple be destroyed, like he just said? When will the whole when will Christ return in glory? You know? So he answers two questions at the same time, which is why it seems confusing to us. So first he answers the temple's destruction. He doesn't really give a sign for the, his second coming. He just speaks more about uh, this pattern of things will occur. Uh, he talks about this, um, et cetera. So I think then he mentions here, um, for similar reasons, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets, they describe Babylon's destruction, Tyre, Egypt, and of Judea by the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. They pass at once to the anti-type, destruction of the world, being the future fulfillment of that. So again, we're, we have these things um, shown in sign before, nations being judged and destroyed, as the final example of all wicked nations being judged and destroyed before the coming of Jesus. So a pattern is given to us here. Uh, let's see, he talks about this a little bit. He says here, about the darkening of sun and moon and the falling of stars, this writer, um, he mentions here, understands the blindness of the Jews and their calamities, and the slaughter which was made of them by Titus. So Josephus says there were signs, and some heeded them. Now the Christians heeded them, because they were warned by Jesus. So he said no Christians were destroyed when Jerusalem was destroyed. They ran away. They heard, heard Christ's understanding. But Josephus says we all saw these signs, and some heeded them, some did not. He himself did heed them, because he was not killed in Jerusalem. Um, by the shaking of the powers of heavens, this author understands the flight of the Christians from the city, whose holiness it was sustained the city. So they left, he says. The sun shall be darkened, he says, well, um, he says, not until after all are raised from the dead. But again, he says, this could refer to um, a eclipse of the sun, sun and moon dark, which happened at Christ's own death, remember? And across the sun was eclipsed. So such a thing could occur. It could be an eclipse of the sun or something like that. Um, so he goes into detail about that one a little bit there, eclipse of the sun darkening of the sun. Now again, remember too, also in Egypt the sun was darkened, right? As a sign of God's judgment upon them. But the Israelites, there was no, no darkness where they lived. So it also refers to that. Um, and then the moon as well, he speaks about that being... Now symbolically, he says, when the master of the household dies, his whole household is troubled. So in like manner, when the human race, whom all things were made, is about to come to an end, or be you know, fulfilled, changed at the resurrection, all creation languishes. So that's a, kind of a deeper thought there we have. St. Paul mentioned this too. All creation groans in expectation to we are saved. That somehow we messed up all creation by sin, and so it's waiting for a final redemption. You know, until the new heaven, the new earth, when all our bad stuff has happened. Now, of course, we can see we act, we make things worse by our own actions, pollution, destruction, you know, just destroying species, all this stuff. We've got to mess up the world. But even like our, our sense, our sin um, is a imperfection of the world, is a ruining of the world. And so the more we're saved from sin, the more creation is destroyed. That's why some of the saints talk, were with animals, right? They had friendship with animals, and they were at peace, like St. Francis of Assisi, you know? Uh, Elijah was fed by a raven with food, you know? There's a fun book my friends found called Animal Helpers of the Saints to their kids. It's a cute book for kids, but it's like real things that the saints did, you know? Because here again, like Christ, the lion will lie down with the lamb, uh, or the, the future uh, creation will be at one at peace again. So the saints kind of foreshadow that, kind of peacefulness with nature and everything we like, you know? Um, now he mentions here, stars falling from the heavens, uh, comets and like bodies, he says. We don't mean actual stars, because of course he says, those are way bigger than Earth, they couldn't fall on us, you know? 
it says things that appear to be stars. And actually, they used back then the word for um, planets even is like moving stars. That's the only word they have. It's like one word to describe all the stuff up there. We talked about that. Um, so it goes into a lot about the powers of heaven here being shaped. as the angels could be involved, could refer to them as well. Are they all going to assist at the judgment? He goes in great detail about that again. Even if you read everything, great details there. Um, he says, Then it shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. He says, What is the sign of the Son of Man? He says, I answer, it's the cross. For this is the sign because it is the standard of Christ and the cause of the victory of unbelievers. As it was before time, the scandal of unbelievers and the impious, so will it be in the day of judgment, their condemnation and torment. So the Father says, So the church herself gives this meaning, her sanction, when she says, Things in the office for a holy cross day, this sign of the cross shall be in heaven, for the Lord shall come in judgment. He speaks about that. So in a sense, uh, he mentioned there was a cross-shaped star. Josephus said that, the sign of judgment. But also, again, really, the cross itself, in fact, is the sign of judgment. You know, people have a chance to accept Christ. Even these days, they know the cross is his sign, and they can reject that cross, reject the sign of that cross. I just saw the movie Quo Bodies the other day in 1951, big Hollywood epic, you know, thing. It was during the reign of Nero Caesar when he ter- persecuted the church. And there's a centurion, uh, a prefect, he's kind of, he's uh, falls in love with a Christian girl, so he's trying to decide, should I become Christian or not? So he's there in the house, and they have a little cross on the wall. I'm sure they actually used those yet at that time. He takes it and breaks it and throws it down. I don't want this sign of the cross. He hates it, you know? Eventually he sees that's the sign he has to choose to accept or to reject. And so the same way is true. The sign of this, this cross to take up my cross, accept suffering. That's a sign of whether Christ will come into my life or will, whether I'll push him out, you know, what's going to happen. So in a very personal sense, again, these, these end time things speak about also our own end, you know, the end of our life too. Does Christ, do we allow Christ to come in judgment, in power and glory? Do we accept him, accept the sign of the cross in our lives? Do we try to push him out? What happens there? So a lot of deep stuff to consider, of course. Um, and again, um, they mentioned, is this a bad thing? No, it's the beginning of a new heaven, a new earth. This is when you see these signs, stand erect and raise your heads, because your redemption is at hand. So it's not a thing to be, be coward and afraid of. If we accept Christ in our life, we seek to carry our cross after him. This is part of our redemption, you know, to, to walk in Christ in glory. It's not a bad thing. Only for those who, who hate Christ in this church and all those who follow him. For them it's bad, because they've rejected Christ and they hate everything he stands for. But if we want to follow him and accept him in our lives, it's a good day to welcome the Lord when he returns and to add to that. What are some thoughts about some of those things? Caution us to stay awake, be vigilant. This is the same readings, um, similar themes used in a funeral, by the way, to be vigilant and welcome Christ when he comes. Yeah, I can't contemplate all of this without mentioning the moon last night, how big the moon was. Oh, yeah. How big the moon was. Big full moon, yeah. And everybody commented. I mean, Linda mentioned the moon to me. And when we went to choir practice, uh, Linda Hoffman mentioned the, how bright the moon was. And Mark had a little story about how bright the moon was. And it's, uh, I think the moon is a strange, a strange object. That's for sure, yeah. It disappears, you know, it's, it's out of your thoughts for the longest time, and then all of a sudden you have a night where it's you know, bright and shining, and you can see it, you're awake to see it. We just talked with the kids the other day about the uh, appearance of Mary at Guadalupe. So a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet, so Revelation speaks about that too, you know. And Mary appearing exactly that way from Revelation. It's kind of proving the interpretation that she is that woman, you know. Um, so the moon to her feet, you know, what's that about? Uh, and some of the other uh, images of Mary show her standing on the moon, you know. So in a sense, like, um, there's a relationship that, that she reflects the light of Christ. Some describe her as the mirror of God. You know, she's not about, it's all about me. She says, I want to show you to Jesus. So I think Mary does is to lead us to her son, Jesus. She reflects his light. So in that sense, we're all called to be that sort of moon, the light of Christ, the, you know, the sun, the son of God. Um, and also, too, in Guadalupe at Vents, these things are not God. They are less than even me, who's not even a God, you know? He said, I'm, I'm the mother of the true God. And so she puts to, to flight all their false gods, you know, their gods of death, of human sacrifice, the stone serpent, Quetzalcoatl, the moon was a god, the sun was a god, and said these things are beneath her, and she's clothed with the sun instead, you know? 
that's pretty deep. So the idea of us too, that we're called to reflect the light of Christ, be the light of the moon. And also maybe the idea, you mentioned Jack, that Mary, she's kind of behind the scenes, hidden a lot of times, and we see her like pop up all of a sudden, you know? Some of those appearances of Mary in history, even our lives, too, all of a sudden we are in trouble, and we realize you know, Mary's help, and we cry out to Mary, or her assistance leads to Christ, and there, there they are helping us out. So. I think this part he mentioned, you know, don't become drowsy. Don't let the anxieties of daily life distract you, too. That's something else I think we can we focus on too much, you know? We can be, you know, avoid carousing and drunkenness, but sometimes the anxieties of daily life, that can catch us. We get too zoned in on those things, we forget uh, that, that God's in charge, you know, he's taking care of us. Let's pause just for a moment, reflect on some of these lessons we've heard.